John writes in the first chapter of his gospel, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and apart from him not even one thing came into being that has come into being. For in him was life, and the life was the light of mankind. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not grasp it. This year it seems like people began decorating for Christmas even earlier than usual because of the darkness that we have been going through together. We were quick to turn on lights to look ahead and to hope. We want to lighten the darkness around us, bring beauty to the ugliness that wears us down. We decorate because it is tradition, because it lifts our hearts, because it makes us feel like children again. We decorate, deck the halls, because company is coming. The prophet Isaiah declared that God will give a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, a mantle of praise instead of a faint spirit. No matter how far we feel from the spirit of the season, God promises to decorate us with love and with joy. We light these candles as a sign of our joy in the beauty of things of this season not just the things that glitter and flash, but deeper things, the beauty of the heart and the soul, the beauty, love, shared in service and hospitality. We light this candle of joy because company is coming. O oh, come, O oh, come, Emmanuel. Amen. Company is coming. Good morning, First Temple. I'm Evan. I'm the teaching pastor here. It is good to be with you and to celebrate this Christmas season together. I have to give a thank you to those of you who were able to volunteer yesterday at our first blessing shoe giveaway to watch these kids from our community. They had pre-registered through their schools. Kids who could really use a new pair of shoes came with their families and got to pick out a brand new pair of shoes. And it was a beautiful thing. So thank you for serving. Thank you for your generosity so that we can do those kinds of things and impact our community. Now we've been doing First Blessing for a while now and there were some differences that had to happen this year because of the pandemic and our restrictions. And, and one of those differences is we could no longer uh, do the breakfast meal that we usually did. And, and I'll tell you, I was a little bummed to miss out on the sausage and pancakes by Jonathan Brown and his crew. It is one of the highlights of my year. There's been much this season that we've missed out on, been bummed about, much that has changed. We light the third candle uh, of Advent this week, the pink one. It symbolizes joy. But in a year when many have lost much, jobs, and loved ones, and friendships, maybe the job you have is the same job you have had, but the expectations are very different. We've been through much, and joy might seem far away. I brought this photo someone shared of their neighbor's Christmas decorations. <laughs> she said, my, my neighbor's J fell down. I think it's better this way. Hashtag 2020. Oi. <laughs> I think we can relate to this feeling for many of us. But we are not the first people that have this kind of feeling. We've been looking at this series, How the Light Gets In, and, and studying some of the writings in the book of Isaiah, this incredible poetry that illuminates this experience and God's promises in the midst of it for the people of Israel who had been taken into exile because of their disobedience. The nation of Babylon came in, took them out of the city, destroyed Jerusalem, took them to the city of Babylon, their way of living, their culture, their customs, 
all challenged, surrounded by these new ways of thinking and living. They only knew about their homeland by the stories and practices passed down as the exile lasted for a generation and another. And in the midst of dark, difficult days, suddenly a message of hope appeared. The prophet Isaiah declares that the captivity will end, that hope will come, and that the hope is more than just going back home. It is bigger, it is wilder than they ever imagined. We've talked about the light getting in in Advent. We talked about the dark the first week, light last week, and today we talk about how we might prepare for the light that is coming. A light that reveals things. A light that will reveal the ruins around us and bring us comfort in the sake of in the reality of the ruin. But the light also might reveal things we don't want it to reveal. The light also will challenge the comfort of those who find the life, the way of life, comfortable now. Jesus' light always brings comfort to those in ruins and challenge to those in comfort. Look with me at Isaiah chapter 61. We'll begin there. Isaiah 61, we'll read verses 1 and 2 first. And here we have this incredible poetry coming from a speaker who is this servant, described as God's anointed, who brings this message of hope to God's people. We as Christians know that this is the voice of Christ, Jesus. This is Isaiah 61, 1 and 2. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed or to the poor, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and release the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort, to comfort all who mourn. Scholars think that this passage was particularly used to encourage these people in exile as they awaited going home to their homeland. And in fact, that this might have been the very passage they read when they first might have arrived back out of exile. They had heard about their homeland, Jerusalem, heard great, exaggerated, beautiful stories from their parents and grandparents, never seen it themselves. But when the exile ended and they returned home, they would have found a city in ruins. Many of their expectations would not have been met. There was work to be done. Their place, their homeland had been pillaged and left for nature to take over. And in the midst of all of that, they hear this message of hope. Good news to the captive. In fact, it even goes so far in verse 2 to say, I proclaim a year of the Lord's favor. This is a concept from Leviticus 25 a year of jubilee. It is this vision, this vision that we find in the Old Testament that God's people might once every 50 years declare that all debts are forgiven, that all people in prison can be set free, that all servants could go back home, that all property that was lost could be returned, a year of forgiveness, of restoration, and here, this message of the servant proclaims a year, but not just a singular year, a sense of an age, a culture, a promise that the people of God will be marked not just by a year of God's favor, but by the continuation of God's favor. Who they are about would be a people of forgiveness restoration, and hope that what God had for them as they returned to the ruins, in the midst of their darkest days, what God had for them was beyond what they ever imagined or expected. So what we find in the light as it breaks in is that God's plan is to comfort those who are in the ruins. So we must prepare. We must prepare for the light to shine on the ruins around us the way we do that is we ask. 
What is broken? Where are there ruins in our midst? What needs fixed in your world, in my world? Where do we need jubilee? Where can we look for God to work and how might we join him? This is good news. Good news for those of us dealing with a difficult year. Good news for those of us whose jay has fallen over. Let's keep reading. It's so good. This is verse 3. To comfort those who mourn, provide for those who mourn in Zion, to give them a garland instead of ashes. Oil of gladness instead of mourning. A mantle of praise instead of a faint spirit. They will be called oaks of righteousness. Planting of the Lord to display his glory. They shall build up ancient ruins. They shall raise up former devastations. They shall repair the ruined cities, the devastations of many generations. Do you see what happened here? The first part of this poem, the Lord has sent me to do these things. We see this message, this commission of Christ and what he is to do in our midst to bind up, to bring good news, to proclaim liberty. And then in the second half of this poem, what we discover is they will do these things. They will build up the ancient ruins. There's a shift here. That as we prepare for the light and discover the ruins around us, God restores us and then invites us to join in, to be people of jubilee and restoration, to be people who comfort in the midst of ruins. I imagine the people, as they return to their homeland and they read this scroll and see the ruins around them, they know that God has acted before. They pray that God will act again. They see this invitation to begin to be people of restoration. Now, if you like, you're like me, you're probably tired. If you're like the person whose J fell over, you're probably tired. You're tired of not being able to see all of your family or go the places you want to go. You're tired of hearing about people who are ill, of getting bad news. Maybe you're even discouraged when we come back to worship and in person for those of us who are able to do that and we see that we've had to take out half the chairs and lots of people that we love to see can't be with us right now. For those of you watching online, uh, I imagine you can be discouraged that you can't be with and hug your church family right now. I'll be honest, I have been discouraged plenty over these months. Just last week, I preached in our 930 Modern service, and as people came in for that service, they all sat in the back. We we don't like to talk about it over there, but we're still Baptists, and they all just sat in the back. And the way the lights are, they're very bright in that room, and so you can't really see past the front. So I went up to preach, and I knew there were people back there somewhere, maybe. But all I saw were these green chairs, and I was discouraged. And I know that I shouldn't be, right? That's, that's my, my, my left brain knows that there are good reasons and we need to be safe and we are doing the right thing and we have to act with care and compassion and God is at work and this is okay and, and God will continue to bring us out of this and do incredible things. I know all that in my left brain. My right brain is bummed out a lot. You probably feel this way too. Maybe you miss the choir. I miss the choir. I'll give a little plug for Christmas Eve, though. The choir has come, many of them, and recorded themselves individually, and we can patch them together for our Christmas Eve to create this cool virtual choir. I'm very excited about it. There's a lot more editing that we got to do, but we're getting there. I'm excited for you to see it. But as I think about the things that I'm discouraged about, the things that I miss, The temptation is to just wish for the way things were. But is that all there is? Is the reason that I'm a pastor so that when I preach, I might see lots of people and feel good about myself? No. Is all that it's about is getting back to like things were? 
And I've been thinking, there are lots of things that, that I don't want to go back to. Things we've learned, things that the light of this time and the challenges we faced has revealed for sure. I think about how much my marriage and my parenting skills has grown over these months. At the beginning, it was touch and go, let me tell you. We've grown. I don't want to go back to be the husband, the father that I was before all of these months. I think about my life as a Christian and the challenges that we've been through have forced me to commit more deeply to the unforced rhythms of grace, of rest and Sabbath and scripture and prayer in ways I've never done it before. I've grown. I don't want to go back. And so in the midst of things that feel so ruined, I have to ask, In the same way that it's revealed to us that God does new and better and things beyond what they would ever expect to the people of Israel. This message of deliverance, they think it's about captivity. Wait till they find out it's about sin and death too. What if Jesus has more for us, his church, than we can even imagine? Are we prepared to receive a light that will challenge us? Yes, but will invite us to participate in something new and something beyond what we expect and imagine. Now, there were some who heard this message and were not prepared for it. See, anytime the light breaks in, it reveals things that may not want to be revealed. Every Christmas, we, uh, we hide our, our presents in the guest room. It's where we wrap the presents. Nobody goes in the guest room. We can keep it all secure. Nobody is supposed to go in the guest room. The problem is, our cat does not abide. And at any opportunity, the cat will get into the guest room and hide in the guest room. And so we have to play the game, hunt for the cat. And my daughter's two and a half, that's her favorite game to play, hunt for the cat. When my daughter plays the game, my cat does not appreciate it. We have to get the implements to hunt for the cat. It takes two things. You need a broom <laughs> to gently encourage the cat. To go where the cat needs to go. It's kind of the only way to encourage a cat is the gentle encouragement of the broom handle. The other tool that you need is a light. There's nowhere you're going to find that cat without that light. She gets up in the box springs. It's a whole mess. She gets in there. So I take the broom handle. My daughter takes the light. She kind of shines it where it's maybe supposed to go for a moment. And we look under the bed and we see those eyes. We found the cat. As we prepare for the lights, We have to realize it may reveal things we're not so sure we want revealed. There were people who were not ready for this. This message, this message of Isaiah 61, this text is the text that Jesus uses when he preaches his first sermon that is recorded in the Gospels in Luke chapter 4. I want to turn there to Luke chapter 4. We'll start in verse 16. Jesus, when he came to Nazareth, where he'd been brought up, went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day as was custom. He stood up to read The scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll, and he found the place where this was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives, recovery of the sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. He rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of all on the synagogue were fixed upon him. And Jesus began to say to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. And the very first words of Jesus' sermon are today. This is happening. I am here. This promise that you have heard before of God setting things right, of the year of the Lord becoming the way that things are, of good news to the poor, captives to be free, blind to see. I am the messenger. I am the one God has anointed to do this. I am the Messiah. Now the people who heard this, it says in verse 2, all spoke well of him. They were amazed at his gracious words that came from his mouth. They said, is this not Joseph's son? Immediately they're excited because they know this guy. He grew up in the town of Nazareth. This is his hometown synagogue that he is preaching to, and they are thinking, this is our guy. What will this mean for us? Think about the tourism dollars. I don't know. How will we benefit from this one whose diapers we changed being our answer? But they were not prepared 
for what God was going to do with his light. See, we see that God's plan brings comfort to those in ruins, but it ruins the comfort of the comfortable. Look what Jesus says in verse 23. Doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, doctor, cure yourself, and you will say, do you hear also in your hometown the things you've done in Capernaum? He said to them, truly I tell you, no prophet is accepted in his prophet's hometown. But the truth is, there were many widows in Israel in the time of Elijah, when heaven was shut up for three years and six months and there was a severe famine in the land. But Elijah was sent to none of them except for a widow at Zarephath in Sidon, that is an outsider. There were many lepers in Israel at the time of the prophet of Elisha, yet none of those lepers were cleansed except Naaman the Syrian, that is, an outsider. When they heard this, all in the synagogue were filled with rage. They got up. They drove him out of town. They led him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built so they might hurl him off a cliff. But he passed through the midst of them and went on his way. Ain't nobody was singing Christmas carols after this sermon. Jesus points out these stories in the Old Testament where God's work and deliverance happened not for the insiders, but for the outsiders. Jesus wants to illustrate, tell them that his message is not just for the select few, not just for the comfortable, but for the outsiders. It is a message to go out. He is not just here for them. They would have heard this like maybe townspeople gathered in a local gym to hear where their star athlete was going to sign, only to find out they signed for the rival school. Jesus says, this isn't about you. See, they had been comfortable in their status as God's people. Comfortable as people who knew Jesus. Comfortable. As people who didn't have to do anything, they were already set, comfortable, like my cat in the box spring. And then the light got in, and so did the broom handle. And Jesus challenges them to think not about themselves, but of others, and it makes them angry. How do we prepare for the light? I think we also have to examine where we're comfortable. Where is our faith easy? When was the last time we felt pushed by the message of Jesus? How do we feel thinking about Jesus' grace and mercy and promise and hope going to those out there and not just in here? How might we participate? Are we willing? Jesus knows these people need a message of comfort in the midst of ruins, and other people need a message of challenge in the midst of comfort. He provides both. That's what his light does. I need to hear that message because I I can get discouraged and think ministry is all about me. I can preach a sermon over there and see that looks like nobody's in the room. I can get discouraged to the point where I walk off the stage and think, man, why? So that I might miss the four people that walked down, wanted prayer, wanted to know more about Jesus, wanted to join the first temple family. God was at work even though I had preached objectively a dud. See, the story of Christmas is about Jesus bringing his light that does new things in our midst, that brings encouragement and hope to the places where there is ruin and challenges the places that are comfortable. The story of Christmas is never about returning to the old things, the comfortable things, the easy things, but it's always about God making something new among us. It's good news. It's good news because we don't want to go back. It's good news because God is not done and God is doing more. I love how one writer says it as he thinks about the message of Isaiah and this uh, promise and hope that comes out of this interesting passage that must have been so mysterious to the people who read it the first time. He says, on the third day of Advent, a welcome promise comes into a world that is sick and tired of the same old, same old. Out of the dust and smoke and fog and darkness emerges a figure we can't identify yet, bringing good news we can't define yet. In a world full of questions which there's no easy answer, perhaps this text is exactly what we need. We're still in the dark, but help is coming soon, and he will be more than we expect. 
and more than we imagine. O come, O come, Emmanuel. What is ruined that we long for God to restore, that we can participate in the restoration of? Where are we comfortable that we need to be shaken up a bit? What if what God does is not what we expect? Are we okay with that? One of the things that's different this year at First Temple, besides the lack of sausage and pancakes at First Blessing, is Christmas Eve. We're doing it online, and, and, and I love our Christmas Eve service. There is nothing more beautiful than hundreds of people crammed together with a candle in the air. We can't do that this year. We'd have to have like eight services to pull it off, and the fear is as cases climb, we'd have to cancel and be stuck. And so months ago, we made the decision that we're going to do Christmas Eve online. Last year, I sat right there for our kids' service with the glow sticks. My daughter, one and a half, it was like her first worship experience that she could be with us as a family. She listened to the songs and saw the skits the whole time, just pointing and yelling, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. She saw the manger. She knows that has something to do with Jesus. My neighbor has these wooden sawhorses that look kind of like a manger. Every time he puts them out, she was like, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. We don't get to do that this year, not the way that we're used to. Instead, we've invested in doing an online service. It's going to be different. And I, and I know that your right brain might be a little bummed about that. I'm bummed about it, but you know what? Christmas isn't about me. And so I want to give you a really tangible challenge this Christmas season, that we, the people of First Temple, might realize that God might be doing something new. And that God is still at work, even in the midst of things that aren't the way that we want them to be. God was still at work yesterday when lots of the ways we did things were different, and lots of kids got shoes and hope and heard about Jesus. God is at work and has been at work in this place and continues to be. And I believe that on Christmas Eve with an online service, people who would have never set foot in this place will hear the good news of Jesus. So I want to invite you to join us, to participate, to be part of the people who build in the midst of the ruins. I want you to share the service, to invite people to watch it with you. You're going to spend time with family, watch the service with them. If you go on our Facebook page, there's a little event page. Just click that you're going and all of a sudden all your friends will see it. How might we take this message, this light, and prepare for it to go out way far beyond what it would have otherwise? How could we use that energy that we might have because things aren't the way that we want them to be and be disappointed? How might we repurpose that to be people who take this good news out into the world? How can we be people who are challenged to build in the ruins, to challenge our comfort, and together, in the midst of everything, See this story of Christmas with new, fresh eyes. And like my little daughter, all together, the people of First Temple point at Jesus and say, Jesus, 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 come see what I've seen. Let's pray. God, I thank you that you are not done with your people. I thank you that your message is one that speaks to us when we are in the midst of ruin. It is encouraging and challenging. And for those of us who think we've got it all figured out, it challenges us too. So God, may we prepare for your message and what you have for us this season. Perhaps to engage with you for the first time, to see that your promises are good and true. That hope is coming that you have come and will come again and set the world right and death will be no more, that you invite us to salvation now and forever. And with that hope, how might you use your people in the midst of all of this to be people who raise up ruin, build in the midst of the ashes, string garland, cover in oil, the places that others thought were hopeless or dead. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.